for you. Thank the Lord for this beautiful day, this beautiful weather. Um, I've never been happier that this part of the lawn, exactly this part, is in the shade. It's, uh, it's right here. Um, some of you have dug out or wish you had that funeral fan from about 40 years ago uh, that used to be common. Um, the, uh, we start a new series today. Some of you that you see there in your worship program, or if you are online or even here and have, have gone to version and pulled up all the scriptures and notes, um, and you see we've started a new series today called How to Neighbor. How to Neighbor. Um, I was praying while we were uh, visiting with Mariah, and, uh, and uh, uh, let, let me just say, uh, I, I would have said this earlier so he didn't hear me say it, because um, he might be watching now, but we had, we had a great visit with my cousin Jeff. Just keep praying for him and his family. Um, it was great to see him, and... Uh, and I, I truly believe God is doing a work uh, there. We got to see Mariah there. And while we were there, uh, Annie and Mariah had some serious things to take care of because everything in Tennessee is, is really open. And so all the stores that Annie has been deprived from here are all open there. And so they found it necessary to go out and stimulate the economy single-handedly, um, or try anyway. And I kind of hold away because the other thing that's open in Cleveland are coffee shops. I didn't know how much I missed those. And I found me a little corner in my favorite spot and really just began to pray and ask God, what are we going to do for this summer? Normally I plan way out, but with everything that's going on, the crisis, it's just, it's not been as easy. It's not been there. And so I, I really was trying to plan, like, what do, what do we need to hear from you for this summer? And this series came across my radar and I looked at it. And I immediately said, I don't, I don't think we need to deal with all that right now. You know, let me, there was another one that was much more encouraging. It, uh, it was current and talked about how to deal with the virus and, and, uh, and how to, you know, deal with in troubled times. And he brought encouragement. I said, that's the one. And God kept bringing me back to this one. And I, I, I wrestled and wrestled with it, but I really believe this is important for us. So for the next four weeks, we're going to look at at this idea of how to neighbor, how to, how to be a good neighbor. I'm not a big fan of using nouns as verbs. It drives me crazy when people say, I, these ki the kids, you know, these kids these days. Now that I'm 50, can I say that now? The kids these days, kind of, I've got my get off your, my lawn card. Um, they, they'll say, I've got to, I've got to start adulting. I'm like, that's not a word. That's not a, that's not a verb. That's a noun. That's not a thing. And then now I've seen things in print where they're doing seminars and workshops on how to adult. And I'm like, no, that's just bad grammar. That's not a seminar. That's... And, and, and so I, I hesitate to say this, but I'm doing that today. We need to learn how to neighbor. We need to learn how to neighbor. So over the next few weeks, next week we're going to look at, at, at embracing orphans. What does that look like? Those that are, that are orphaned, uh, both physically and spiritually. And we're going to look at uh, empowering the poor. What does it mean to, to deal with the poor that are, might be our neighbors or the lonely the last week? But today, I want to talk about the races reconciled. Some might say racial reconciliation, and that's just a big fancy word to mean we need to learn how to neighbor well when it comes with people that are different than us. Jesus tells a story uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 25. It's a story that most of us are familiar with. It's one of those, those good you know, children's stories we teach. It says this in verse 25. One day an expert in religious law stood up to test Jesus by asking him this question. Teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus replied, what does the law of Moses say? How do you read it? The man answered, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind. And... Love your neighbor as yourself. Right, Jesus told him. Do this and you will live. The man wanted to justify his actions. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? 
Now, you may have heard me talk about this passage before. There's a couple of times where one place where Jesus, someone asked him, what's the greatest commandment? Here, the man said, how do I have eternal life? And Jesus, in some places, just quotes from Deuteronomy, this verse that says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, soul, your strength, your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus actually gave that answer one time and said, on these two things hang all the commandments. In, in this a particular instance, we see that this law and the Bible, the, Matthew, uh, Luke, I'm sorry, Luke, maybe because he's a doctor, he gives us a little more detail, but he tells us that this expert in the religious law came to test Jesus. He, he gives us his intentions. He wasn't an earnest seeker wanting to know what can I do? I really want to have eternal life, whatever. He comes to Jesus in a way of testing him. And he says to him, what do I have to do to get eternal life? Jesus, as he often did, flipped around and asked him a question. Well, what did Moses say? What did the law say? Well, the man apparently knows, knows the scriptures well, knew, knew the, the law well, and he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and your mind. He said, listen, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, well, if that's what it says, then go do it. And, and it says here that the man wanted to justify his actions. Now, here's the deal. He wanted to know, he asked him, he says, well, who's my neighbor? But he didn't want to know because he wanted to know who he should love the most. He wanted to know who he didn't have to love. He wanted to know who he could get away with not loving. He said, well, who's my neighbor? Tell me who my neighbor is. He was looking for a loophole. Tell me who my neighbor is, and I, I, that way I won't be guilty of this. Or maybe he was, the Bible says he was there to test Jesus. Maybe he was trying to get Jesus to say something about one particular. Then he could go and say, Jesus said, we don't have to love these people. He was trying to find a way. Who's my neighbor? Notice that in Jesus' response, he doesn't, and, and this is kind of where the name of this series comes from, he doesn't tell him who so much, or he doesn't tell him who to neighbor, he tells him how to neighbor. Jesus answers with this story, verse 30. Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant, or, or, or Libras, it was a Levite, walked over and looked at him lying there. But he also passed by on the other side. Now here we see this man, Jesus is telling the story, and he says, there's this man, this Jewish man, and he is... On the road to Jericho, which we know is a historically just sort of dangerous kind of road. And, and some thieves, robbers, beat him up, left him for dead. The Bible says he was half dead. They needed Miracle Max, apparently. Uh, no, that's when you're mostly dead. Uh, he, this guy was half dead. And it says he left him by the Bible. And it says a priest came by. And a priest uh, came along. And when he saw him there, he crossed to the other side of the street. Now, I don't want to make excuses necessarily for this place, but, but let's understand something for a second. The, the priest's job was to minister in the temple, minister in the, in the tabernacle. David. One of the restrictions for a priest is if he went anywhere near anything dead, whether it was a, a, a cat, which is always a, a good thing, um, a, 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 a cow, you know, some kind of animal, or this man, he said it was half dead. He, for all he knew, he was dead. If he'd have gotten near him and touched, he would have had to, like, sit out of work for, like, several days. He couldn't have ministered in the temple. So it's possible that he kind of was trying to be careful. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. He just says he crossed to the other side. Whatever his reasons, he didn't even try to check on it. Then a Levite, a temple assistant, kind of walked by, and he did the same thing. He said he, he walked, I love how the New Living says here, says the priest crossed the street, like, didn't, just didn't want to get near him. The, the, the Levite actually walked over and looked, kind of checked him out, and then said, I don't know, and then crossed back on the other side and walked away. Jesus continues with the story in verse 33. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. Now, you have to understand, when Jesus is telling this story, to answer the question of who is my neighbor, 
I bet everybody in the room just probably kind of, the, the air probably got sucked out of the room, you know. Or maybe if they were outside, I, just, I don't know how the air gets sucked out outside. But it was just jaws on the floor. Just because when he said a Samaritan came by, now he's talking about a group, uh, an ethnic group of people that Jews hated. And, and Samaritans hated Jews. See, 700 years before, back, back during the captivity, when, the, when Israel was taken to Babylon, there was a remnant that got left while the Jews, the main Jews, were all in captivity. And that remnant intermarried with, with some of the pagan peoples that worshipped false gods and things. And, and when they did that, they had children, they had kids. But when everybody came back from captivity, there were these kids that were kind of half pagan, half Jewish, and sort of mixed up. And that's, they, they kind of settled in Samaria. That's where Samaritans came from. And the Jews, and, and, and we don't know a lot of reasons. I've heard some people speculate the Jews were sort of mad because they got to stay. They didn't have to go to captivity. Whatever the reason was, whether it's jealousy or whatever, they hated them. They just didn't like them. Well, as often happens, a people groups, so one people group hates one group, the other one hates them right back. And this had been going on for a long time. To the point that when Jesus tells this story, it's funny that he would say this because it was very common. If you saw a Samaritan and you were Jewish, you crossed the street. You walked to the other side. So here he is telling the story about how a Jewish man is hurt and the priest and the Levite who are Jewish wouldn't cross the street. They wouldn't walk across the street for the Jewish guy. But the Samaritan does the opposite of what they would normally do. He crosses the street. He goes across the street. He takes care of him. I love this quote from, from one of Dr. Martin Luther King. His, one of his messages, he's talking about the Samaritan. He said this, The first question the priest and Levite asked was, If I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But the good Samaritan reversed the question. He said, if I do not stop and help this man, what will happen to him? See, it was a mindset thing that Jesus was trying to portray here. But, but more than that, he answers the man's question when he says, well, who do I have to love? Jesus told the story, but he could have summed it all up by saying, the one you hate. That's who you have to love. The one that's had hatred and envy and enmity forever. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the heart of, of the mission of C3. I'll keep it short. Love God. Love people. Change the world. I think sometimes we want to jump to change the world. And we forget that you can't change the world unless first you love God. And you can't love God. The Bible says you don't even love God if you don't love people. That's the part. That's what he's saying. We've got to love all people. Can I tell you when we talk about we talk about racism, we talk about this idea of racism. Did you know that there is no racism gene in your DNA? You're not born with that. That doesn't come. You're not born. You're not born with hate. That's not something you're born with. Um, the great uh, uh, philosopher, actually he's a comedian. There's a guy, Dennis Leary. I do not advise you to watch any of his stuff. He, 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 I think he licks the gutter every morning sometimes. But he made this statement. He said, racism isn't born. It's taught. He said, I have a two-year-old son. Do you know what he hates? Naps. That's what he, that's what he hates. It's not something you're born with. Let's look at some reasons for a second. Let's look at some reasons for why does racism exist? Number one, it's learned from experience. It's learned from experience. And I mean that in this way. Somebody hates you. Somebody doesn't like you for some reason. And you just hate them back. It's an experience. You experience hatred and you tend to respond that way. Or you're, you, you experience it so much you can't help but feel that way. It comes out of experiences. You learn it. Here's the second reason. Uh, you're raised to hate. Now, 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 I think there probably are some homes 
uh, there's some sociopathic homes that where they actually teach their kids hate. I mean, overtly, you should hate this. Most of the time, though, I think a lot of it is just it, it's 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 the way a family is. This is just the way we are. And kids learn from the way they see their parents act. They learn from their environment. They learn from the way they're raised, from the way they're they're grown. It's sort of like we don't we don't hang out around them. I, I think I'm safe to tell this story. I, I don't think I'm betraying his his honor in any sense, but Annie's dad was considerably older than her mom. Um, by about almost what, 20 years? 18, 19 years, something like that. He was almost from another generation from Annie's mom. I mean, he fought in World War II. Um, and, and, and was older, much older. And he had learned a lot from his environment. I remember talking to Annie one time about there's, there's the schools there in Amelia, and there's a public school, and then there's a private school. It wasn't necessarily, necessarily a Christian private school, sort of-ish. So, was it? No. So it, well, oh, it was? Okay. Yeah. Um, that may not have been their first mission, but it was in a nature, you know. Yeah, because I spoke at their, they have a chapel. So I guess if you have a chapel service, that's Christian. Okay. Um, and I asked Andy, though, one time, I said, she said, yeah, we went to the, we went to the academy. I said, well, why did you go to the academy? And she said to me, because daddy didn't want us going to the public school. Because we would have gone to school with black kids. And I knew her dad. I was like, what? And he was raised at a time. And I said, your dad has never acted like that to me. What she goes, no, he's not like that at all. She said, I can remember many times us pulling over the side of the road. A black family broken down and he'd get out and help them and do stuff. He'd do for anybody. But he'd been raised in such a way that you don't get, he was still from that era. You don't drink from the same fountain. Now, he didn't believe that. Now, that God blessed him with a really socially active daughter, not Annie, but, but her older sister, who worked in the inner city Philadelphia after she, in between, uh, in between when she finished up at, uh, at William and Mary before she went to, to Princeton the Seminary, she worked in inner city Philadelphia. And she would often bring kids home on purpose from the mission. And she would give, and she had to literally re-educate her daddy. Now, now, there were some books that stretched me even, but he needed to be stretched a little bit. And by the time I got to know him, he wasn't like that at all. He had been perpetuating what he had learned generationally. And he didn't have a hateful bone in his body. He just thought that's the way things were. And it was amazing. There towards the end when he was sick in his home, one of the most frequent visitors was an African-American man that lived in their neighborhood that would come by and check on him. And they would sit and talk for hours. And there was a genuine love and respect. And I watched this man who grew up in an environment where he wasn't, I don't know that he was raised to hate. It would be interpreted that way today. He was just raised in a way that that, that was what they, was considered normal. No, it wasn't. It was wrong as rain. But that's what it was. And I watched him, his heart change over the years. That can be a reason for racism. Three, third reason is we're just ignorant to other cultures. And I don't mean ignorant in a bad way, like you're ignorant, you're stupid. I don't mean that way, but we don't have a knowledge of. And, and people, human people, tend to fear what they don't understand. They tend to fear what, they, what, what is different from them, what looks different. Now, please notice in your notes that this is listed. This is a category here that says reasons, reasons. And here's the next big statement. There is no excuse for racism. These aren't excuses. These are things that why it might exist because I said we're not born with it. But there is no excuse for racism. There's two places here. Some of you probably could have already filled it in because you've heard this a hundred times in the last couple of weeks. And it's because it's true. Racism is not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. It's not a skin issue. It's a sin issue. And, well, and the reason I want to point that out is because if we're not careful, we can look at the reasons that racism exists and we can make them excuses for why it exists. And say, well, we don't have to be accountable. It's not my fault. I'm that way. I'm just that way. No, here's what James said in James chapter 2, verse 9. But if you favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. 
You are guilty of breaking the law. I love how James beats around the bush. I love how he doesn't get to the point. I say that sarcastically. He gets right to it real quick. He says, look, if you favor somebody over somebody else, you don't treat everybody the same, that's sin. He doesn't say it's bad for you. It's probably, it's under, so we understand it because of how you grew up. We understand it because you just don't know any better. He doesn't say that. He says it's sin. I don't think you say that any clearer. It's actually sin. Well, if it's sin, then it's something we need to deal with. I, I, I want to, let me just say, there's no simple answer for really any sin. I mean, there is. Just don't do it. But some things take work. Not to be forgiven of sin, I don't mean that. But when we have a problem that can create sin in our lives, we need to deal with it. Here's the first thing we've got to do if we're going to deal with sin. You've got to, first of all, recognize any prejudice that you have. Now, I, I know it's tough sometimes. I, I get hit with this sometimes. I think, I don't have any. I don't, I'm not prejudiced. But the reality is we all have prejudice. We all have things that, that are things we do. He, let me define it real quick so we know what we're talking about. Prejudice is defined as, as prejudging. Preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. Preconceived opinion that's not based on reason or actual experience. When you judge somebody before you know them, when you judge somebody before you have any experience with them, or no reason, there's no reason there. I can judge when a snake rolls up in the yard. Because I hate snakes and I don't want them to bite me. I don't, want to, I don't care if it's a good snake, but there's no such thing to me as a good snake. I mean, if it's good, Nathan needs to come get it, put it where it needs to be where I can't see it, because it, if it's around much longer, I'm going to find something, and it's, it's not going to be long for this world. But I, there's reasons. I have reason that. And I'm not saying if you've got a reason, you've got some kind of preconceived reason, then you can judge. That's not the point. But when you judge something without anything, this I'll never forget. And, and, and prejudice comes, it comes naturally out of sort of stereotypes, some things that, that exist, and stereotypes are real. They exist for a reason. They're, they're real. Um, some stereotypes I didn't even know about. Did you know that according to Ashley Barber, all black people are afraid of dogs? Now, I remember hearing the story, and when Zoe heard that, she was like, what? That ain't true. But that's what Ashley thought. Because they were on a hike a couple weeks ago and a little dog came running out barking and it, Meredith said she could not move fast enough. Now somewhere, sometime, I'm guessing, Ashley, this graduation Sunday, I get to pick on you. I'll, I'll uh, I'm guessing at some point you did not have a good experience with a dog. No, okay. But see, this, but then this stereotype starts developing. It's like, oh, and, you know, and, and, and I, I've seen this breaking stories. I'll never forget here in the story, when we lived down in North Carolina, um, there was a, a, one of my, my closest friends there was a guy named uh, Luis, his actual name was Luis uh, Torres, I, but he's been called Cacho his whole life. And I, uh, it's just a nickname, but that's what I've, I've always called him, Cacho. And he moved here from Mexico City to pastor our Spanish speaking congregation that was there at the church there in North Carolina. Well, his wife, uh, uh, they both used to teach at the University of Mexico, Mexico City. His wife was a brilliant teacher. Um, she came here and had to do a bunch of remedial things because we didn't, you know, they have all the equivalency. And so she's having to do that. She was teaching in a, in a drama-based sort of charter school. Cacho was on staff at the church. They were really wise, saved their money well. And, and after they'd been there a, a couple of years or so, um, they went and got pre-approved to buy a house. They wanted to buy a house there in town. And there was a house that we found out about because uh, our, our clerk at the church, her, uh, uh, a friend of hers or somebody she knew was moving out of the house, was retiring and moving out of this big house, downsizing. And she found out it before it ever went on the market. Well, Cacho called on the phone and said, we'd like to, I know this house isn't listed yet, but can, oh, the realtor was excited. Listen, if you're a realtor and you hadn't even listed it yet and somebody wants to come see it, man, that's great. That's just, just that's awesome. So he gets there, but apparently Cacho didn't sound Mexican on the phone. 
Because when the realtor, who was sort of a good old boy, uh, uh, got there and saw Cacho and his family get out, the first thing he said to him was, uh, excuse me, folks, I'm about to show this house. I don't have time. If you could move on, I need to show this house to a family that's coming. Cacho said, yes, that, that is us. And he said, oh, oh, okay. Oh, I, I didn't realize. All right. He opened the door and said, well, uh, it's, everything's there. Just check it out and let me know what you think. I'm quite certain that's how he treated other clients. That's not even the part I want to talk about. This is the best part. Cacho comes out and he says, now, now listen, uh, you, need to, you might want to go and check with the bank. This house is kind of expensive. Cacho said, yes, I know we, we've already been pre-approved for this house. Oh, 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 you have? Oh, okay. And then he said, this is the kicker. This is my favorite part. Now, you need to understand this house is part of an HOA. That's a homeowners association. And they've got a lot of rules. You're, you're not going to be able to put livestock in the backyard. And Cacho looked at him and said, now you have to know my friend Cacho to know this. He said, what? What about all my chickens? Um, the closing went even better. I won't even talk about what happened at the closing. It was, it was a lot of things. It was amazing to me. This man was going to make money on this house. And yet there was something that he had judged this family because of their appearance, because of the way they... I have no idea, but there was a there was a judgment there that came from a place, and he was judging him on all kind of criteria that didn't exist. When they closed on the house and got the keys, Cacho got home, and by the time they got home, there was already a sign in the yard with that guy's picture on it, saying "Another house sold." First thing Cacho did was yank that out and toss it out by the curb, and his wife Diana said, "Cacho." What? You can't, that's a man's sign. You can't do that. And he said, no, no, no. He said, no animals in the yard. <laughs> See, but we all come to things with, with bias and prejudice that they're grown in. Some of them are just sort of innate. You know, uh, rich people are all snobs. You know, did you know that? All, all, uh, all fat people are lazy. This younger generation, they don't like to work. Um, you know, most pastors are crooks. Did I, I didn't write that in there. Old people really are done. They don't have anything to offer. They really should just kind of be quiet and sit down somewhere. Now, this one, unfortunately for me, is true, but it is a stereotype. You know, to the point they made a whole movie about it. White men can't jump. Now, for me, that happens to be true. My nickname on the, on the, on the basketball court was Ground Jordan. <laughs> Here's one I love. We talk about prejudice. There's a lot of people uh, I run into that will say, they'll be real quick, and they'll say, well, I'm not racist at all. But, now let me tell you, I don't care what comes after that but. It stinks. You can take that for what it's worth. Nothing good comes after that. It's almost like a precursor. I'm not that, but. No, they don't say that. See, we have these things, we kind of, we, we, we do this. Now, can I tell you, I don't want to, I don't even tell this story because I don't want to admit that I'm guilty of this. And I don't, really, I don't mind, you know, I tell all kind of junk on myself, but Annie is a part of this story. And I don't want to tell it on her because some of you think that she parts the seas and her halo is shining so bad right now, you put the umbrella back up, I can't. Annie and I had a trip planned in October of 2001. 2001. You remember what happened on September 11th of 2001? We had a trip to fly from Raleigh, North Carolina to Florida, to Orlando. One of those wonderful trips that I got a really good deal on and made her sit through like a three hour presentation. Um, I got one of those calls this week. She reached across and tried to hang my phone up while it was in my hand because she thought I was going to say yes to this. 
So we had this trip planned. Well, by October, it's it's about three weeks after, well, okay, so maybe a month. About a month after September 11th it happened. We talked about it, and I said, look, this is there's no safer time to fly, really, because they've got so many regulations. I mean, right after 9-11, man, it was like lockdown at the airport. You, you couldn't, you know, all, uh, didn't have some of the rules we have now, but, but still it was. And I said, look, I think it's probably safer now to fly than ever. You know, I convinced her of that. So we get to the airport early, it was early morning flight. We got there, the gate hadn't even opened. We're standing waiting, it finally opened. We got in, we went, we went through. So we're at the gate pretty early. Well, a lot of people at that time were flying straight. This is back when you could fly straight from the gate. Well, you still kind of can if you're not checking bags. But a lot of people were checking in at the gate. They were getting their boarding passes, they were doing this. It's, just, it's funny to me sound that, that that 2001 was so long ago that there weren't all, but there weren't, there weren't all these kiosks where you can check in, you know, self check. You had to check in somewhere. So a lot of people go straight to the gate. You didn't have to have a boarding pass to get to the gate. You just had to have some kind of itinerary and you could get to the gate. So we're sitting at the gate early and there's this long line of people checking in. Well, we're sitting there and we both saw him, but I didn't want to say anything. She didn't want to say anything. And finally she looked at me and I was like, yeah, I see. And there was a man standing in the line to check in. Obviously, Middle Eastern, his appearance, skin color, no everything, just about him. Just you could just tell he was from somewhere in the Middle East. And we both looked at him, and it was like, mm, I don't know. I don't know if I want to get on the plane. I, I I hate to say that and admit that, but I was feeling it. I was like, and I was justifying it. Well, 9-11 just happened. I mean, you know, it's just I don't know what in the world we're gonna get on the plane, and he's carrying a bag. You know, and I swore I could hear a ticking. I mean, I'm just like, whew, I don't know. I'm just checking him out. And Annie's looking at Annie's. She don't like to fly anyway. And she was going, oh, you know, she was the worst. She wasn't praying. She wasn't blessing him. She was just judging, judging, judging this man. And he's making his way through the line. And we're sitting in that front row right by where you get on. And, and so... He's getting closer. The, the, the check-in plays right here at the gate. And he's so right back, he's right beside us. And his phone rings. And I about jumped out of my skin because his phone rang. He was like, oh, who oh, was scary because it made noise. And he, he reached in his pocket. And he answered his phone. And he said, and I am not exaggerating. Hello? Hi. No, I ain't got on the plane yet. No, it's, it's going to be on time. But we got to get... No, I'm supposed to be there around sometime mid-morning. I don't know. I guess I'll call me a taxi cab. I mean, he was country as country could be. And we both just started laughing, mostly out of relief. And I, I, we've, we've talked about this after. There's really no excuse for that. We just, we totally judged this man on his appearance. And somehow... I mean, he could have been the one Islamic terrorist that talked with a country accent. We, I, but somehow that gave us peace. We suddenly, oh, whoo. It's like, what were we thinking? Why were we even thinking that? You've got to recognize your prejudice. You've got you to ask God to help you. Recognize your prejudice. Here's the second thing. And I, I've got to hurry. Because I don't know if you know or not, but Victor ain't coming. Here's the second thing we've got to do. We want to deal with this problem. We've got to seek to understand others. We've got to examine our own prejudice, but then we've got to seek to understand others. We've got to listen to others and hear their heart. I struggle with this more than any, probably any one thing. And, and not just in this area, I struggle with this like at home. I mean, I, I, I wrestle with this. I, Meredith, come here. Um, I, will, I will just hand, hand the umbrella to your mom. Um, when, when, we, when we run into things that we don't understand, and we're finding it hard to love somebody, and we see that stuff creeping up in ourselves. Sometimes we want to explain why we feel the way we feel, or why that person's feelings maybe aren't rational or something, and 
that's not what we need to do if we're going to fight this problem. Here's how I, this is how I fail at this at home. Maybe you can make this application. So, Mary's in her room, and we get one of them loud thunder strikes. And I don't know if it's just loud around my house because of the trees around it or something, but man, when they strike, it's loud. The whole house shakes. Now, it'd be better if Mariah were here because she's much more afraid of that than Merit at this. But just play along, pretend you're Mariah. Okay. Um, especially when they were little, my natural inclination, and I tried this early on, my natural inclination to fix the problem of their, what I considered irrational fear, because the, the lightning wasn't coming in the house, the lights weren't even going off, it was just a loud thunderstorm. But it caused fear in my child. My inclination was to explain to them how they couldn't get in the house, that's just a thunderstorm, it's just water, it's just rain, it's just loud sound, there's no reason for you to be afraid. What I needed to do was just say it's gonna be okay. I don't, I don't, I don't understand why you're afraid, but it doesn't matter if I understand. I need to listen to you for a minute. Just make sure you're okay. We're not gonna fix the problem of any kind of struggle between differences in people. We don't stop for a second and don't try to explain and just say, hey, you know what, I love you. There may come a time later when we can have conversation and discussion as you build relationship. I think sometimes relationships have to come first before we douse them in truth for anything. And the reality is sometimes, sometimes our truth is our opinion. And that's okay, we're allowed to have different opinions, but when the storm comes, she don't need my opinion. I'm sorry, this COVID thing has not allowed me to do this with many people, and so I'm enjoying this right now. We've got to seek to understand others. We've got to listen. We've got to have a conversation. We've got to build relationship. You can go. Wow, you're kind of sweaty. We've got to, we've got to find our own prejudice. We've got to understand others or seek to understand others. And then you've got to love those that are different from you. You've got to actually love somebody that's different than you. I heard this story this week and it just, I, I, I don't know how I'd never heard it before. Some of you may have heard it. I think it was on the news at some point. Back in 1996, there was a, a small little contingent of of, of thinking of all the adjectives I want to use here and I'm just going to stop and not use any of it there was a, a group of KKK people that up in Michigan that wanted to have a little rally and the local police there knew there were going to be protesters and so they did the really smart thing and they separated everything from the get go they made sure the protesters weren't near them put up barricades they separated them but one of the Klansmen somehow didn't get the message, and they're not the brightest people in the world. Sorry, I, I said I wasn't going to comment, but that's just truth. Can I douse you with a little bit of truth? And he got caught up in the other crowd. And somebody recognized something on him, some tattoos, something, whatever, that identified him as one of those people. And they began to scream, kill the Nazi, kill the Nazi, he's one of them. And the crowd converged on him and started beating him. There was an 18-year-old African-American girl named Keisha Thomas. She dove into the crowd and covered this young man and wouldn't let them beat him. She put herself at physical risk for somebody who wanted to probably end her life. I mean, who does that? 
Well, it made some news and she got interviewed afterwards. Why would you do something like that? She said, I'm a committed follower of Christ. And I knew what it was like to be hurt. And many times when that's happened to me, I wish someone would have done that for me. <laughs> Can I tell you what she did in light of the story Jesus told? She crossed the street. She crossed the street to help somebody different than her. She says she's gone on to develop actually some nonprofits to really help to bring about reconciliation. She says she tries to do something every day to try to break down those stereotypes. No, no big grand gestures. I've never heard her name before. But she says that small, regular acts of kindness are the most important. Here's a quote from Keisha. The biggest thing you can do is just be kind to another human being. It can come down to eye contact or a smile. It doesn't have to be a huge monumental act. But can I tell you something? Racism is not, is not just the presence of hatred. It's also the absence of love. You notice that Jesus didn't say, and make sure you don't hate your neighbor. He said, that's not good enough. You got to love your neighbor. It's not good enough to just sit and be quiet and not hate them. You've got to actually love them. See, God sees no difference. Galatians 3.28, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. He created us in his image. We all bear the image of God. Romans 10 and 12, Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone, I love this in verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's how God sees. Can I tell you how God sees it? This is what it's going to look like in heaven. John in Revelation got a glimpse of the future. He got a glimpse of a lot of things, past, present, future. This is one of those future things he got a picture of in Revelation 7 and 9. He said, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands, and they were shouting with a great roar, salvation comes from our God. Our God. Our God. Not my God. Not the one I follow. He's standing there. He said, they're standing there, locked arm in arm. Every tribe, every nation, every tongue, everybody. And they said, salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the land. Can I tell you, at the end of time, John sees every tribe, people, language together as one. And they're not shouting, we did the right things. They're not shouting, we did everything right. We didn't fail at anything. We did everything right. We didn't offend nobody. They ain't saying that. They didn't say we worked, we worked really hard to achieve reconciliation. They're not saying that. They're saying salvation comes from our God. See, we are to love our neighbor. Not just not hate them. We are to love them. And notice, and we talked about this before. You know, there's different words for love. The word love that he uses here when he says you need to love your neighbor as yourself. It's that agape word. Now that's agape, it, it's not, it's impossible to do that without God because God is agape. He is love. What this tells me is, if we're going to see any kind of reconciliation, it's got to be with him. It's got to be with God. And can I tell you this? Reconciliation, I heard an incredible message this week. Uh, there's an African American pastor, and I think he's out of Houston, Andy and I have heard him live a couple times in, in Richmond at some different homeschool events, but his name is Vodi Bakken, an incredible minister of the gospel. And I heard a message he was preaching uh, out of this passage in, in Ephesians. He was preaching about reconciliation. He said, here's the problem. We think we have to try to achieve reconciliation. He said, reconciliation is done. It's finished. God already reconciled us and to himself. Two ways. First of all, through the cross. 
Here's what it says in Ephesians 2, 14. Now here he's talking about Jews and Gentiles, but that separation is even greater than any kind of skin color separation we see. That separation was like, you were with, if you read the first part of the passage, it says, Gentiles, you were without God. You were godless. He says, but now, verse 14, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. He united Jews and Gentiles into one people when in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And our hostility toward each other was put to death. He bought he brought this good news of peace to him, to you Gentiles who were far away from him and peace to the Jews who were near. Now, all of us can come to the father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. I love here. He's using sort of this temple language when he says far from near from it's, it's that that principle, you know, the temple was built with an outer courtyard. Then there was a, the, the inner court then the holy place, then the holy of holies where God was. And so when he says near and far, we see this language used a lot in the Old Testament because they had that picture of God. God's in the holy of holies. And he says to them, he says, I brought peace. Now understand this, this is something not how we think. He says, I brought peace to the Gentiles who are far from me. We're on board with that. They need peace so they can get to God. They're the have the problem. But he says this, I brought peace to those who are far from me and peace... To you Jews who were near. You both needed it, he said. You both needed it to come together. Yes, I came for the Jew, he says, but I'm also for them, and I'm going to have to give peace to both of you, and I'm going to bring you together. It has to happen. Reconciliation has to happen through the cross. And, and when I say it has to happen, it already has happened. One of the things that I, I heard in the message by Pastor Bachram, he said this, he said, we fight so hard to achieve reconciliation. What we need to do is believe reconciliation. God has reconciled us. He has paid the price on the cross. Our job is not to work, work. Now, now listen, I don't, that's not to take away from the three things I just mentioned. We've got to do what it requires to fix the problems that are between us. But ultimately, he has reconciled us. He has paid the price on the cross. Our job is to believe that what he did meant what it did. And can I tell you, when you hate your brother, this is why the Bible says, if you hate your brother, you don't love God. Because when you hate your brother, you deny the work he did on the cross. When you are not reconciled to one another, regardless of your differences, when you are not reconciled to one another, you're denying the reconciliation he did for you on the cross. The Bible is very clear, especially in 1 John. You can't love one. You can't say you love one another. James mentions it too. You can't say that and then say you love God. It doesn't work that way. It's got to be through the cross. We need to do what it takes. We need to re have God search our hearts, find those prejudices. We've got to seek to understand one another. We, we've got to love somebody that's different. But, but you can't do that. Without the love of God. And that happens at the cross. Here's the second thing. It's through the cross and it's by the Holy Spirit. As a, as a, as a world, confusion came back in Genesis 11. Some of you know that's children's story about the Tower of Babel. And the Bible says that people on the earth at that time, this is just post the flood, this is after the flood, not many people, and they begin to grow, and they begin to get smart, and they begin to do things. And the Bible says they begin to get together, and they built this city. And the, the, the problem was not that they were building a city or building a tower, but their intention was full of pride. It was basically saying, we don't need God. We can do this ourselves. Look away. And God says, the Bible says, it, read that in chapter 11. God says, in one of those wonderful Trinitarian ways, like when he said, let us make man in our own image, you can hear God talking to himself in a sense in, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And he says, they have got to the point where nothing they put their mind to is impossible. Now that obviously, humanly, not everything is possible, but basically he's saying every purpose they have, they have they are seeing that they have no need for God anymore. They have no need for me. And so he says, let's go down 
and we're, I'm going to confuse their languages so they can't communicate. And once he does that, they become different. And he said they scatter throughout the earth. Now, here's why that's important. That happened way back in Genesis 11. Acts 2, verse 1 says this. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Now, most translations, older translations say there. Uh, actually, I kind of have to go with King James to see it. it says they were meeting with one accord. But here it's just translated together. That word doesn't just denote that like they were with another person. It, it means they were of one mind with no dissent, all in agreement together that they were going to wait on the promise of God. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of tongues or fire, flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. What does God do in Genesis 11? He brings confusion with different languages so they'll have a need for him and scatter them into the earth. On the day of Pentecost, he brings language again, but this time to unify. In such a way that everybody outside, no matter where they were from, could understand. He brought unity. They started in unity. They started. They did the work. They got together in one mind and one accord. And then he came and he gives them the Holy Spirit. And here's the purpose. Purpose in Babel. The purpose in Genesis 11. To scatter them into the earth. The purpose in Acts was the same. Acts 1 and 8. You shall receive power. He told them before he left. You receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This time he scatters them with a commission. He didn't just scatter them to keep them from building up pride. He sends them out into the world. He gives them the Holy Spirit. He gives them one language. Can I tell you, I've used this word over and over again. I don't like the word because it's man-made. The word race in and of itself is not biblical. You do a word search for race in the Bible, you'll find two or three places where it refers to sort of ancestry, meaning the, 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 the line, the family line of a certain person. Most of the time it's talking about a race you run in, but you can't find that in Scripture. You see it where it talks about the human race over and over again. The Bible only recognizes a race. Now, I just said in, in Revelation, we're going to see every tribe, every nation. It's, God allows for difference. He loves different. That's great. But race in and of itself is a man-made construct that was developed in order to put some people down. Some genius, and I use that with incredible sarcasm. Let me say it with Greek. Some idiotes decided... If we can divide people by their color, then we can justify owning some of them. They're less than. We're better than. It created division. It was a man-made construct to do that. And it has done nothing but bring division ever since. It's evil. It's demonic. It is from the pit of hell. It is not biblical. It is not the way God sees things. God sees things. We're all one. From every tribe and nation and tongue. It's okay to have a heritage. It's okay to, you know, I get a little jump in my step when I hear, you know, bagpipes for something, you know. And I'm going to say this one more time. I keep saying this. I'm going to say it in public. I want It's on the record. I want bagpipes playing Amazing Grace at my funeral. And she always looks at me and says, okay. And I don't think she's going to do it. Y'all hold her to it. She always goes, okay, you won't be here. It's okay. It's okay to have a heritage. It's okay to, you know, 23 and me, D and I don't know, whatever, I think, where you come from, all that stuff. That's fine. But when you start leaning on that to make yourself feel better or different, make your difference better, that's where the Bible says it's a sin. Now we need to meet back at the cross through the power of the Holy Spirit to acknowledge and believe the reconciliation that God has brought to us. He has brought us together. He has brought us together for one purpose, to go out and tell. 
that verse, I, I want to read all of it. And I've, already, I've already gone so long. The verse I read to you earlier where it says, you know, Jew and Gentile are the same as from Romans. They have the same Lord who generously gives all of them. And it says in verse 13 of, of chapter 10, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. He's here for everyone. But the next verses you keep reading says, but how will they know if someone doesn't tell them? How will they know about this reconciliation if somebody shares it with them? That's the whole purpose of the Holy Spirit. So that send you, commission you to be, to take the reconciliation he has given you and all of us at the cross and go and share that good news with others. That's what we're called to do. So I, I want to encourage you this week. And not just stop this week, but I know it's tough right now. We're, we're trying to social distance. I'm praying every day for the end of that destructive force. But in any way you can, search your heart. Start today. We're coming to a time of response. I'm just going just to go right there. It's, again, it's not like Victor's going to show up out of the blue. Victor, if you're at home watching this, I hope you appreciate. It's time for us to respond. And... As we respond today, I, I always say this in our time of response, respond with what you have. Respond with your time. You know, memorize the scripture there in Ephesians. I think it's 2.16. Make those commitments to ask God to help you find those, those prejudices in your heart and ask God to help you receive that reconciliation. Respond with your, your giving, your finance. You've done so incredibly well through this crisis. You have been so faithful, and I just I, I honor you for that. Continue to give of your finances and prove God is who he says he is. And then respond today. If you've got communion with you, you can do that. Do it when you get home. If you're at home, do it that way. I pray that very soon we're going to have it all for you where you can all participate here. But as we come to the table today, I, I say this every time we respond, but especially today. You know, the Bible says this. It says when you, when you bring your gift to the altar, and in a sense as we come to communion to the table, you're bringing yourself, you're giving yourself and saying, God, I'm bringing, I want communion with you. The Bible says when you, when you bring your gift to the altar, and not, it doesn't say, and you have a problem with somebody. It says if you know somebody has a problem with you. It says, leave your gift. Go reconcile. Uses that word. Go reconcile to that person and then come back. Now, listen. I'm not trying to exclude you from communion today. If you physically can, and you know that's an issue with you and somebody, call them. Do what it takes. If you're here today and you've got communion, participate in communion. Pray and ask God to help your heart. But then go reconcile. That's a part of this. So I, I want us to pray and I want to ask God to search our hearts today and make sure there's no sin in our heart where we may have preferred somebody over another for any reason. I want you to pray with me today. And if you need to make that step of faith and say, I, I, I want God to be the Lord of my life, make that step. If you've already done that, ask God to search your heart. Make sure that you come to this place. This is a sacred moment. You come to this place worthy. Father, you are so good to us. So much more than we deserve. God, I ask you today to forgive us. Forgive us for, for times that we have intentionally, unintentionally, Times where we should have said something and we didn't. Times we said something we shouldn't have. Times we've acted in ways that are not pleasing to you. God, forgive us for every thought, word, and deed that would have kept us 
in some way in our mind or our hearts to be above anybody else. Forgive us, Lord, of our attitudes, our, our expressions. But today, if there's anybody here that needs to know you, I pray that they'll just simply speak it and ask you to forgive us of our sins. Come into my heart. Cleanse my heart today. Be the authority, the, the owner, the supreme ruler in my life. Be my Lord. I, I want to repent today. I want to change directions. Not follow after what I think is right, but follow after you. God, I thank you for that night before you died for us, that you broke bread. You took it, you broke it. And you told us to take and eat of it. That this was your body that was broken for all of us. So I pray today for those as we take this, Lord, those that are broken for whatever reason, that you would bring healing to their body today. As we partake of you, in a, in a spiritual sense, Lord, bring healing to our bodies in a very real way. Bring healing to our hearts, healing to our minds, healing to our bodies itself. Lord, we thank you for what you did for your body that was broken. Will you take the body now? On that same night you took the blood, the cup, and you said, this is the cup of my new covenant. I'm establishing it for you. You said, this is my blood. Your blood was poured out for us. Your blood brings unity. Your blood brings everything we can't. We thank you, Lord. I ask you to bless this. Let it be as cleansing for us as you intended it to be spiritually and in every other way. Lord, we thank you for your blood that was shed. Will you take Lord, I thank you. I thank you for the healing that is beginning right here. Lord, I pray, Lord, for our world right now that you would let them see you and be reconciled to you as we are reconciled with one another. Thank you, Father, for your gift of reconciliation. Help us to be stewards of that gift as we reconcile with one another. With your help, through the power of the cross, through the infilling of the Holy Spirit, help us to be one the way you intended. We thank you, Father. We pray today as we leave this place, our benediction from Psalm 1914. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Go and be blessed. Be the bringers of reconciliation to this world.